Book Eleven, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Eleven, Debaters and a Warrior Girl, Part Two. These words, so full of malice mixed with art, inflamed with rage the youthful hero's heart. Then, groaning from the bottom of his breast, he heaved to wind, and thus his wrath expressed. You, Drances, never want a stream of words. Then, when the public need requires our swords, first in the council hall to steer the state, and ever foremost in a tongue debate, while our strong walls secure us from the foe, ere yet with blood our ditches overflow. But let the potent orator declaim, and with the brand of coward blot my name. Free leave is given him, when his fatal hand has covered with more corpse the Sandrin strand, and high as mine his towering trophies stand. If any doubt remains, who dares the most? Let us decide it at the Trojan's cost, and issue both abreast, where honour calls. Foes are not far to seek without the walls, unless his noisy tongue can only fight, and feet were given him but to speed his flight. I beaten from the field, I forced away, who but so known a dastard dares to say. Had he but even beheld the fight, his eyes had witnessed for me what his tongue denies. What heaps of Trojans by this hand was slain, and how the bloody Tiber swelled the main! All saw but he, the Arcadian troops retire in scattered squadrons, and their prince expire. The giant brothers in their camp have found I was not forced with ease to quit my ground. Not such the Trojans tried me, when, enclosed, I singly their united arms opposed. First forced an entrance through their thick array, then, glutted with their slaughter, freed my way. "'Tis a destructive war, so let it be but to the friggin' pirate and to thee. Meantime, proceed to fill the people's ears with false reports, their minds with panic fears. Extol the strength of a twice-conquered race, our foes encourage and our friends debase. Believe thy fables, and the Trojan tongue triumphant stands. The Grecians are overthrown. Suppliant at Hector's feet Achilles lies, and Diomed from fierce Aeneas flies. Say, rapid Aufidus, with awful dread, runs backward from the sea, and hides his head, when the great Trojan on his bank appears. For that's as true as thy dissembled fears of my revenge. Dismiss that vanity. Thou, Drances, art below a death from me. Let that vile soul in that vile body rest. The lodging is well worthy of the guest. Now, royal father, to the present state of our affairs, and of this high debate— if in your arms thus early you defied, and think your fortune is already tried, if one defeat has brought us down so low as never more in fields to meet the foe, then I conclude for peace, tis time to treat, and lie like vessels at the victor's feet. But, oh, if any ancient blood remains, one drop of all our fathers in our veins, that man would I prefer before the rest, who dared his death, with an undaunted breast, who comely fell by no dishonest wound, to shun that sight, and, dying, gnawed the ground. But if we still have fresh recruits in store, if our confederates can afford us more, if the contended field we bravely fought, and not a bloodless victory was bought, their losses equaled ours, and for their slain, with equal fires they filled the shining plain, why thus, unforced, should we so tamely yield, and, ere the trumpet sounds, resign the field? Good unexpected, evils unforeseen, appear by turns, as fortune shifts the scene. Some, raised aloft, come tumbling down amain, then fall so hard, they bound and rise again. If Diomede refuse his aid to lend, the great Messapus yet remains our friend. Tolumnius, who foretells events, is ours. The Italian chiefs and princes join their powers, nor least in number, nor in name the last. Your own brave subjects have your cause embraced. Above the rest, 
the Volscian Amazon contains an army in herself alone, and heads a squadron, terrible to sight, with glittering shields in brazen armor bright. Yet, if the foe a single fight demand, and I alone the public peace withstand, if you consent, he shall not be refused, nor find a hand to victory unused. This new Achilles, let him take the field, with fated armor and Vulcanian shield. For you, my royal father, and my fame, I, Turnus, not the least of all my name, devote my soul. He calls me hand to hand, and I alone will answer his demand. Drances shall rest secure, and neither share the danger, nor divide the prize of war. While they debate, nor these nor those will yield. Aeneas draws his forces to the field, and moves his camp. The scouts, with flying speed, return, and through the frighted city spread the unpleasing news. The Trojans are descried, in battle marching by the riverside, and bending to the town. They take the alarm, some tremble, some are bold all in confusion arm. The impetuous youth press forward to the field, they clash the sword and clatter on the shield. The fearful matrons raise a screaming cry, old feeble man with fainter groans reply. A jarring sound results and mingles in the sky, like that of swans remurmuring to the floods, or birds of differing kinds in hollow woods. Turnus the occasion takes and cries aloud, Talk on, you quaint haranguers of the crowd. Declaim in praise of peace when danger calls, and the fierce foes in arms approach the walls. He said, and turning short with speedy pace, casts back a scornful glance, and quits the place. Thou, Volusus, the Volscian troops command to mount, and lead thyself our Ardian band. Messapus and Catillus post your force along the fields to charge the Trojan horse. Some guard the passes, others man the wall. Drawn up in arms, the rest attend my call. They swarm from every quarter of the town, and with disordered haste the rampires crown. Good old Latinus, when he saw too late the gathering storm just breaking on the state, dismissed the council till a fitter time, and owned his easy temper as his crime, who, forced against his reason, had complied to break the treaty for the promised bride. Some help to sink new trenches, others aid to ram the stones or raise the palisade. Hoarse trumpets sound the alarm, around the walls runs a distracted crew, whom their last labor calls. A sad procession in the streets is seen, of matrons that attend the mother queen. High in her chair she sits, and at her side, with downcast eyes, appears the fatal bride. They mount the cliff where palace temple stands, Prayers in their mouths and presents in their hands, with censers first they fume the sacred shrine, then in this common supplication join. O patroness of arms, unspotted maid, propitious here and lend thy Latin's aid. Break short the pirate's lance, pronounce his fate, and lay the Phrygian low before the gate. Now turn his arms for fight, his back and breast well-tempered steel and scaly brass invest. The quishes which his brawny thighs enfold are mingled metal damaxed o'er with gold. His faithful fortion sits upon his side, nor cask nor crest his manly features hide. But bear to view, amid surrounding friends, with godlike grace he from the tower descends. Exulting in his strength, he seems to dare his absent rival and to promise war. Freed from his keepers, thus with broken reins, the wanton courser prances o'er the plains, or in the pride of youth o'erleaps the mounds, and snuffs the females in forbidden grounds, or seeks his watering in the well-known flood to quench his thirst and cool his fiery blood. He swims luxuriant in the liquid plain, and over his shoulder flows his waving mane. He neighs, he snorts, he bears his head on high, before his ample chest the frothy waters fly. Soon as the prince appears without the gate, the Volscians, with their virgin leader, wait his last commands. Then, with a graceful mien, lights from her lofty steed the warrior queen. Her squadron imitates, and each descends, whose common suit Camilla thus commands. If sense of honor, if a soul secure of inborn worth, that can all tests endure, can promise aught, or on itself rely, 
greatly to dare, to conquer or to die, then I alone, sustained by these, will meet the Therene troops and promise their defeat. Ours be the danger, ours the sole renown. You, general, stay behind and guard the town. Turnus a while stood mute with glad surprise, and on the fierce Virago fixed his eyes. Then thus returned, O grace of Italy, with what becoming thanks can I reply? Not only words lie laboring in my breast, but thought itself is by thy praise oppressed. Yet rob me not of all, but let me join my toils, my hazard, and my fame with thine. The Trojan, not in stratagem unskilled, sends his light horse before to scour the field. Himself, through steep ascents and thorny brakes, a larger compass to the city takes. This news my scouts confirm, and I prepare to foil his cunning and his force to dare, with chosen foot his passage to forlay, and place an ambush in the widening way. Thou with thy Volscians face the Tuscan horse, the brave Messapus shall thy troops enforce with those of Tiber and the Latian band, subjected all to thy supreme command. This said, he warns Messapus to the war, then every chief exhorts with equal care. All thus encouraged, his own troops he joins, and hastes to prosecute his deep designs. Enclosed with hills, a winding valley lies, by nature formed for fraud and fitted for surprise. A narrow track, by human steps untrode, leads, through perplexing thorns, to this obscure abode. High over the vale a steepy mountain stands, whence to the surveying sight the nether ground commands. The top is level, an offensive seat of war, and from the war a safe retreat. For, on the right and left, is room to press the foes at hand, or from afar distress, to drive them headlong downward, and to pour on their descending backs a stony shower. Thither young Turnus took the well-known way, possessed the pass, and in blind ambush lay. Meantime, Latonian Phoebe, from the skies, beheld the approaching war with hateful eyes, and called the light-foot Opus to her aid, her most beloved and ever trusty maid. Then, with a sigh, began, Camilla goes to meet her death amidst her fatal foes. The nymphs I loved of all my mortal train, invested with Diana's arms in vain. Nor is my kindness for the virgin new. T'was born with her, and with her years it grew. Her father Metabus, when forced away from old Privernum for tyrannic sway, snatched up and saved from his prevailing foes this tender babe, companion of his woes. Casmilla was her mother, but he drowned one hissing letter in a softer sound and called Camilla. Through the woods he flies, wrapped in his robe the royal infant lies. His foes in sight, he mends his weary pace, with shout and clamours they pursue the chase. The banks of Amasene at length he gains. The raging flood his farther flight restrains, raised o'er the borders with unusual rains. Prepared to plunge into the stream, he fears not for himself, but for the charge he bears. Anxious, he stops a while, and thinks in haste. Then, desperate in distress, resolves at last. A knotty lance of well-boiled oak he bore, the middle part with cork he covered o'er. He closed the child within the hollow space, with twigs of bending osier bound the case, then poised the spear, heavy with human weight, and thus invoked my favour for the freight. Accept, great goddess of the wood, and thus invoked my favour for the freight. Accept, great goddess of the woods, he said, send by her sire this dedicated maid. Through air she flies a suppliant to thy shrine, and the first weapons that she knows are thine, he said, and with full force the spear he threw. Above the sounding waves Camilla flew. Then, pressed by foes, he stemmed the stormy tide, and gained, by stress of arms, the farther side. His fastened spear he pulled from out the ground, and, victor of his vows, his infant nymph unbound. Nor, after that, in towns which walls enclose, would trust his hunted life amidst his foes, but rough, in open air he chose to lie. Earth was his couch, his covering was the sky. On hills unshorn, or in a desert den, he shunned the dire society of men. A shepherd's solitary life he led, his daughter with the milk of mares he fed. The ducks of bears and every salvage beast he drew, and through her lips the liquor pressed. 
the little Amazon could scarcely go, he loads her with a quiver and a bow, and, that she might her staggering steps command, he with a slender javelin fills her hand. Her flowing hair no golden fillet bound, nor swept her trailing robe the dusty ground. Instead of these, a tiger's hide overspread her back and shoulders, fastened to her head. The flying dart she first attempts to fling, and round her tender temples tossed the sling. Then, as her strength with years increased, began to pierce aloft in air the soaring swan, and from the clouds to fetch the heron and the crane. The Tuscan matrons with each other vied to bless their rival sons with such a bride. But she disdains their love to share with me the sylvan shades and vowed virginity. And, oh, I wish, contented with my cares of salvage spoils, she had not sought the wars. Then had she been of my celestial train, and shunned the fate that dooms her to be slain. But since, opposing heaven's decree, she goes to find her death among forbidden foes, haste with these arms and take thy steepy flight, where, with the gods averse, the Latins fight. This bow to thee, this quiver I bequeath, this chosen arrow to revenge her death. By whatever hand Camilla shall be slain, or of the Trojan or Italian train, let him not pass unpunished from the plain. Then, in a hollow cloud, myself will aid to bear the breathless body of my maid. Unspoiled shall be her arms, and unprofaned her holy limbs with any human hand, and in a marble tomb laid in her native land. She said, The faithful nymph descends from high with rapid flight, and cuts the sounding sky. Black clouds and stormy winds around her body fly. By this, the Trojan and the Tuscan horse, drawn up in squadrons with united force, approach the walls. The sprightly coursers bound, press forward on their bits, and shift their ground. Shields, arms, and spears flash horribly from far, and the fields glitter with a waving war. Opposed to these, come on with furious force, Messapus, Chorus, and the Latian horse. These, in the body placed, on either hand, sustained and closed by fair Camilla's band. Advancing in a line, they couch their spears, and less and less the middle space appears. Thick smoke obscures the field, and scarce are seen the neighing coursers and the shouting man. In distance of their darts, they stop their course, then man to man they rush, and horse to horse. The face of heaven their flying javelins hide, and deaths unseen are dealt on either side. Tyrrhenus and Acontius, void of fear, by mettled coursers borne in full career, meet first opposed, and, with a mighty shock, their horses' heads against each other knock. Far from his steed is fierce Acontius cast, as with an engine's force or lightning's blast. He rolls along in blood and breathes his last. The Latin squadrons take a sudden fright, and sling their shields behind to save their backs in flight. Spurring at speed to their own walls they drew, close in the rear the Tuscan troops pursue, and urge their flight. Asilus leads the chase, till, seized with shame, they wheel about and face, receive their foes, and raise a threatening cry. The Tuscans take their turn to fear and fly. So, swelling, surges, with a thundering roar, Driven on each other's backs, insult the shore, Bound o'er the rocks, encroach upon the land, And far upon the beach eject the sand. Then backwards, with a swing, they take their way, Repulsed from upper ground, and seek their mother sea, With equal hurry quit the invaded shore, And swallow back the sand and stones they spoot before. Twice were the Tuscans masters of the field, Twice by the Latins in their turn repelled, Ashamed at length, to the third charge they ran, both hosts resolved and mingled man to man. Now dying groans are heard, the fields are strode with falling bodies and are drunk with blood. Arms, horses, men, on heaps together lie, confuse the fight and more confuse the cry. Orsilochus, who durst not press too near strong Remulus, at distance drove his spear and stuck the steel beneath his horse's ear. The fairy steed, impatient of the wound, curvets and springing upwards with a bound, his helpless lord cast backward on the ground. Catillus pierced Iolus first, then drew his reeking lance, and at Herminius threw, 
the mighty champion of the Tuscan crew. His neck and throat unarmed, his head was bare, but shaded with a length of yellow hair. Secure he fought, exposed on every part, a spacious mark for swords and for the flying dart. Across the shoulders came the feathered wound, transfixed he fell, and doubled to the ground. The sands with streaming blood are sanguine dyed, and death with honour sought on either side. Resistless through the war Camilla rode, in danger unappalled and pleased with blood. One side was bare for her exerted breast, one shoulder with her painted quiver pressed. Now from afar her fatal javelins play, now with her axe's edge she hews her way. Diana's arms upon her shoulders sound, and when too closely pressed she quits the ground, from her bent bow she sends a backward wound. Her maids, in martial pomp on either side, Lorena, Tulla, fierce Tarpeia, ride. Italians all, in peace their queen's delight, in war the bold companions of the fight. So marched the Thracian Amazons of old, when Thermodon with bloody billows rolled. Such troops as these in shining arms were seen, when Theseus met in fight their maiden queen. Such to the field Penthesilea led from the fierce virgin when the Grecians fled. With such, returned triumphant from the war, her maids with cries attend the lofty car. They clash with manly force their moony shields, with female shouts resound the Phrygian fields. Who, foremost, and who last, heroic maid, on the cold earth were by thy courage laid? Thy spear of mountain ash, Eumenius first, with fury driven, from side to side transpierced. A purple stream came spouting from the wound, bathed in his blood he lies and bites the ground. Liris and Pegasus at once she slew, the former as the slackened reins he drew of his faint steed, the latter as he stretched his arm to prop his friend, the javelin reached. By the same weapon, sent from the same hand, both fall together and both spurn the sand. A mistress next is added to the slain, the rest in round she follows o'er the plain. Tereus, Harpalycus, Demophon, and Chromis, at full speed her fury shun. Of all her deadly darts, not one she lost. Each was attendant with a Trojan ghost. Young Ornithus bestrode a hunter's steed, swift for the chase, and of Apollyon breed. Him from afar she spied, in arms unknown. Over his broad back an ox's hide was thrown. His helm a wolf, whose gaping jaws were spread a covering for his cheeks and grinned around his head. He clenched within his hand an iron prong, and towered above the rest, conspicuous in the throng. Him soon she singled from the flying train, and slew with ease, then thus insults the slain. Vain hunter, didst thou think, through woods to chase the savage herd, a vile and trembling race? Here seize thy vaunts, and own my victory. A woman warrior was too strong for thee. Yet, if the ghosts demand the conqueror's name, confessing great Camilla, save thy shame. Then Butus and Orsilochus she slew, the bulkiest bodies of the Trojan crew. But Butus breast to breast, the spear descends above the gorget where his helmet ends, and o'er the shield which his left side defends. Orsilochus and she their courses ply, he seems to follow and she seems to fly but in a narrow ring she makes the race, and then he flies, and she pursues the chase. Gathering at length on her deluded foe, she swings her axe and rises to the blow, full on the helm behind, with such a sway the weapon falls, the riven steel gives way. He groans, he roars, he sues in vain for grace. Brains mingled with his blood besmear his face. Astonished honest just arrives by chance to see his fall, nor father dares advance, but fixing on the horrid maid his eye, he stares and shakes and finds it vain to fly. Yet, like a true Ligurian born to cheat, at least while fortune favoured his deceit, cries out aloud, What courage have you shown, who trust your course's strength and not your own? Forgo the vantage of your horse, alight, and then on equal terms begin the fight. It shall be seen, weak woman, what you can, when foot to foot you combat with a man, he said. She glows with anger and disdain, dismounts with speed to dare him on the plain, and leaves her horse at large among her train. 
with her drawn sword, defies him to the field, and, marching, lifts aloft her maiden shield. The youth, who thought his cunning did succeed, reigns round his horse, and urges all his speed, adds the remembrance of the spur, and hides the goring rowels in his bleeding sides. "'Vain fool and coward!' cries the lofty maid. "'Caught in the train which thou thyself hast laid! On others practice thy Ligurian arts! Thin stratagems and tricks of little hearts are lost on me! Nor shalt thou safe retire with vaunting lies to thy fallacious sire!' At this, so fast her flying feet she sped, that soon she strained beyond his horse's head. Then, turning short, at once she seized the rein, and laid the boaster grovelling on the plain. Not with more ease the falcon, from above, trusses in middle air the trembling dove, then plumes the prey, in her strong pounces bound. The feathers, foul with blood, come tumbling to the ground. Now mighty Jove, from his superior height, with his broad eye surveys the unequal fight. He fires the breast of Tarkin with disdain, and sends him to redeem the abandoned plain. Betwixt the broken ranks the Tuscan rides, and these encourages, and those he chides. Recalls each leader by his name from flight, renews their ardor, and restores the fight. What panic fear has seized your souls? O oh, shame! O oh, brand perpetual of the Etrurian name! Cowards incurable! A woman's hand drives breaks, and scatters your ignoble band. Now cast away the sword, and quit the shield. What use of weapons which you dare not wield? Not thus you fly your female foes by night, nor shun the feast when the full bowels invite. When to fat offerings the glad augur calls, and the shrill hornpipe sounds to bacchanals. These are your studied cares, your lewd delight, swift to debauch, but slow to manly fight. Thus having said, he spurs amid the foes, not managing the life he meant to lose. The first he found, he seized with headlong haste in his strong gripe, and clasped around the waist. T'was Venulus, whom from his horse he tore, and laid athwart his own in triumph bore. Loud shouts ensue, the Latins turn their eyes, and view the unusual sight with vast surprise. The fiery Tarkin, flying over the plains, pressed in his arms, the ponderous prey sustains. Then, with his shortened spear, explores around his jointed arms to fix a deadly wound. Nor less the captive struggles for his life. He writhes his body to prolong the strife, and, fencing for his naked throat, exerts his utmost vigor, and the point adverts. So stoops the yellow eagle from on high, and bears a speckled serpent through the sky. Fastening his crooked talons on the prey, the prisoner hisses through the liquid way, resists the royal hawk, and, though oppressed, she fights in volumes and erects her crest. Turned to her foe, she stiffens every scale, and shoots her forky tongue, and whisks her threatening tail. Against the victor all defense is weak. The imperial bird still plies her with his beak. He tears her bowels, and her breast he gores then claps his pinions and securely soars. Thus, through the midst of circling enemies, strong Tarkin snatched and bore away his prize. The Tyrene troops that shrunk before now press the Latins and presume the like success. Then Aaron's, doomed to death, his arms essayed to murder unespied the Volscian maid. This way and that his winding course he bends, and, wheresoever she turns, her steps attends. When she retires victorious from the chase, he wheels about with care, and shifts his place. When, rushing on, she seeks her foe's flight, he keeps aloof, but keeps her still in sight. He threats and trembles, trying every way, unseen to kill, and safely to betray. Chloreus, the priest of Sibylle, from far, glittering in Phrygian arms amidst the war, was by the virgin viewed. The steed he pressed was proud with trappings, and his brawny chest with scales of gilded brass was covered over. A robe of Tyrian dye the rider wore. With deadly wounds he galled the distant foe. Gnosian his shafts, and Lycian was his bow. A golden helm his front and head surrounds. A gilded quiver from his shoulder sounds. Gold, weaved with linen, on his thighs he wore, with flowers of needlework distinguished o'er. 
with golden buckles bound and gathered up before. Him the fierce maid beheld with ardent eyes, fond and ambitious of so rich a prize, or that the temple might his trophies hold, or else to shine herself in Trojan gold. Blind in her haste, she chases him alone, and seeks his life, regardless of her own. This lucky moment the sly traitor chose, then, starting from his ambush, up he rose, and threw, but first to heaven addressed his vows. O patron of Socrates' high abodes, Phoebus, the ruling power among the gods, whom first we serve, whole woods of unctuous pine are felt for thee, and to thy glory shine. By thee protected with our naked souls, through flames unsinged we march, and tread the kindled coals. Give me propitious power to wash away the stains of this dishonorable day nor spoils, nor triumph from the fact I claim, but with my future actions trust my fame. Let me by stealth this female plague overcome, and from the field return in glorious home. Apollo heard, and granting half his prayer, shoveled in winds the rest, and tossed in empty air. He gives the death desired, his safe return by southern tempests to the seas is borne. Now when the javelin whizzed along the skies, both armies on Camilla turned their eyes, directed by the sound. Of either host, the unhappy virgin, though concerned the most, was only deaf. So greedy was she bent on golden spoils, and on her prey intent, till in her pap the winged weapon stood, infixed and deeply drunk the purple blood. Her sad attendants hastened to sustain their dying lady, drooping on the plain, Far from their sight the trembling Aaron's flies, With beating heart and fear confused with joys. Nor dares he farther to pursue his blow, Or even to bear the sight of his expiring foe. As when the wolf has torn a bullock's hide at unawares, Or ranched a shepherd's side, Conscious of his audacious deed, He flies and claps his quivering tail between his thighs. So, speeding once, the wretch no more attends, But, spurring forward, herds among his friends. She wrenched the javelin with her dying hands, but wetted within her breast the weapon stands. The wood she draws, the steely point remains. She staggers in her seat with agonizing pains. A gathering mist o'er clouds her cheerful eyes, and from her cheeks the rosy color flies. Then turns to her, whom of her female train she trusted most, and thus she speaks with pain. Akka, tis past, he swims before my sight, inexorable death, and claims his right. Bear my last words to Turnus, fly with speed, and bid him timely to my charge succeed. Repel the Trojans, and the town relieve. Farewell, and in this kiss my parting breath receive. She said, and, sliding, sunk upon the plain. Dying, her opened hand forsakes the rain, short and more short she pants. By slow degrees, her mind the passage from her body frees. She drops her sword, she knots her plumy crest, her drooping head declining on her breast. In the last sigh, her struggling soul expires, and, murmuring with disdain, to Stygian sounds retires. A shout that struck the golden stars ensued. Despair and rage the languished fight renewed. The Trojan troops and Tuscans in a line advance to charge, the mixed Arcadians join. But Cynthia's maid, high seated from afar, surveys the field and fortune of the war, unmoved a while, till prostrate on the plain, weltering in blood, she seized Camilla slain, and round her corpse of friends and foes a fighting train. Then from the bottom of her breast she drew a mournful sigh, and these sad words ensue. Too dear a fine, ah, much lamented maid, For warring with the Trojans thou hast paid. Nor aught availed in this unhappy strive Diana's sacred arms to save thy life. Yet unrevenged thy goddess will not leave Her votary's death, nor with vain sorrow grieve. Branded the wretch, and be his name abhorred, But after ages shall thy praise record. The inglorious coward soon shall press the plain, 
Thus vows thy queen, and thus the fates ordain. High o'er the field there stood a hilly mound, Sacred the place, and spread with oaks around, Where, in a marble tomb, their senes lay, A king that once in Latium bore the sway. The beauteous opus thither bent her flight, To mark the traitor errands from the height. Him in refulgent arms she soon espied, Swollen with success, and loudly thus she cried, Thy backward steps, vain boaster, are too late. Turn like a man at length, and meet thy fate. Charged with my message to Camilla go, And say I send thee to the shades below, An honour undeserved from Cynthia's bow. She said, and from her quiver chose with speed The winged shaft predestined for the deed. Then to the stubborn yew her strength applied, Till the far distant horns approached on either side. The bowstring touched her breast, so strong she drew, Whizzing in air the fatal arrow flew. At once the twanging bow and sounding dart The traitor heard, and felt the point within his heart. Him, beating with his heels in pangs of death, His flying friends to foreign fields bequeath. The conquering damsel with expanded wings The welcome message to her mistress brings. Their leader lost, the Volscians quit the field, and, unsustained, the chiefs of Turnus yield. The frighted soldiers, when their captains fly, more on their speed than on their strength rely. Confused in flight, they bear each other down, and spur their horses headlong to the town. Driven by their foes, and to their fears resigned, not once they turn, but take their wounds behind. These drop the shield, and those the lance forgo, or on their shoulders bear the slackened bow. The hoofs of horses, with a rattling sound, Beat short and thick, and shake the rotten ground. Black clouds of dust come rolling in the sky, And o'er the darkened walls and rampires fly. The trembling matrons, from their lofty stands, Rend heaven with female shrieks, and wring their hands. All pressing on, pursuers and pursued, Are crushed in crowds, a mingled multitude. Some happy few escape. The throng too late rush on for entrance, till they choke the gate. Even in sight of home the wretched sire looks on, and sees his helpless son expire. Then, in a fright, the folding gates they close, but leave their friends excluded with their foes. The vanquished cry, the victors loudly shout, "'Tis terror all within, and slaughter all without. Blind in their fear, they bounce against the wall, or, to the moats pursued, precipitate their fall. The Latian virgins, valiant with despair, Armed on the towers, the common danger share. So much of zeal their country's cause inspired, So much Camilla's great example fired. Poles, sharpened in the flames, from high they throw, With imitated darts to gold a foe. Their lives for godlike freedom they bequeath, and crowd each other to be first in death. Meantime to Turnus, ambushed in the shade, with heavy tidings came the unhappy maid. The Volscians overthrown, Camilla killed, the foes entirely masters of the field, like a resistless flood come rolling on, the cry goes off the plain and thickens to the town. Inflamed with rage, for so the furies fire the Daunian's breast, and so the fates require, he leaves the hilly pass, the woods in vain possessed, and downward issues on the plain. Scarce was he gone, when to the straits, now freed from secret foes, the Trojan troops succeed. Through the black forest and the ferny brake, unknowingly secure, their way they take. From the rough mountains to the plain descent, and there, in order drawn, their line extend. Both armies now in the open fields are seen, nor far the distance of the space between, both to the city bent. Aeneas sees, through smoking fields, his hastening enemies, and Turnus views the Trojans in array, and hears the approaching horses proudly neigh. Soon had their hosts in bloody battle joined, but westward to the sea the sun declined. Entrenched before the town both armies lie, while night, with sable wings, Involves the sky. End of Book Eleven. Book Twelve.
twelve part one of the Aeneid by Virgil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lipa, San Francisco, California. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by John Dryden. Book twelve. The Fortunes of War. Part one. When Turnus saw the Latins leave the field, their armies broken and their courage quelled, himself become a mark of public spite, his honor questioned for the promised fight, the more he was with vulgar hate oppressed, the more his fury boiled within his breast. He roused his vigor for the last debate, and raised his haughty soul to meet his fate. As when the swains the Libyan lion chase, he makes a sour retreat, nor mends his pace, but if the pointed javelin pierce his side, the lordly beast returns with double pride. He wrenches out the steel, he roars for pain, his sides he lashes and erects his mane. So Turnus fares, his eyeballs flash with fire, through his wide nostrils clouds of smoke expire. Trembling with rage, around the court he ran, at length approached the king, and thus began. No more excuses or delays. I stand in arms prepared to combat hand to hand this base deserter of his native land. The Trojan by his word is bound to take the same conditions which himself did make. Renew the truce, the solemn rites prepare, and to my single virtue trust the war. The Latians unconcerned shall see the fight. This arm unaided shall assert your right. Then, if my prostrate body press the plain, to him the crown and beauteous bride remain. To whom the king sedately thus replied, Brave youth, the more your valor has been tried, the more becomes it us, with due respect, to weigh the chance of war which you neglect. You want not wealth, or a successive throne, or cities which your arms have made your own. My towns and treasures are at your command, and stored with blooming beauties is my land. Laurentum more than one Lavinia sees, unmarried, fair, of noble families. Now let me speak, and you with patience hear, things which perhaps may grate a lover's ear, but sound advice, proceeding from a heart, sincerely yours, and free from fraudful art. The gods, by signs, have manifestly shown, no prince Italian-born should heir my throne, oft to have our augurs in prediction skilled, and oft our priests, foreign son revealed. Yet, one by worth that cannot be withstood, bribed by my kindness to my kindred blood, urged by my wife who would not be denied, I promised my Lavinia for your bride. Her from her plighted lord by force I took, all ties of treaties and of honor broke. On your account I waged an impious war, with what success tis needless to declare. I and my subjects feel, and you have had your share. Twice vanquished, while in bloody fields we strive, Scarce in our walls we keep our hopes alive. The rolling flood warm, runs warm with human gore. The bones of Latians blanch the neighboring shore. Why put I not an end to this debate, Still unresolved and still a slave to fate? If Turnus' death a lasting peace can give, Why should I not procure it whilst you live? Should I to doubtful arms your youth betray? What would my kinsmen, the Rutulians, say? And should you fall in flight, which heaven defend, How curse the cause which hastened to his end, The daughter's lover and the father's friend? Weigh in your mind the various chance of war, Pity your parent's age, and ease his care. Such balmy words he poured, but all in vain, The proffered medicine but provoked the pain. The wrathful youth, disdaining the relief, With intermitting sobs thus vents his grief. The care, O best of fathers, which you take For my concerns, at my desire forsake, Permit me not to languish out my days, but make the best exchange of life for praise. This arm, this lance, can well dispute the prize, and the blood follows where the weapon flies. His goddess mother is not near to shroud the flying coward with an empty cloud. But now the queen, who feared for Turnus' life, and loathed the hard conditions of the strife, held him by force, and dying in his death, in these sad accents gave her sorrow breath. O Turnus, I adjure thee by these tears, and whatever price Amata's honor bears, within thy breast, since thou art all my hope, my sickly mind's repose, my sinking age's prop, 
since on the safety of thy life alone depends Latinus and the Latian throne. Refuse me not this one, this only prayer, to wave the combat and pursue the war. Whatever chance attends this fatal strife, think it includes in thine Amata's life. I cannot live a slave or see my throne usurped by strangers or a Trojan son. At this a flood of tears Lavinia shed, a crimson blush her beauteous face overspread, varying her cheeks by turns with white and red. The driving colors, never at a stay, run here and there and flush and fade away. Delightful change, thus Indian ivory shows, which the bordering paint of purple glows, or lilies damasked by the neighboring rose. The lover gazed, and burning with desire, the more he looked, the more he fed the fire. Revenge and jealous rage and secret spite rolled in his breast and roused him to the fight. Then fixing on the queen his ardent eyes, firm to his first intent, he thus replies, O oh, mother, do not by your tears prepare such boding omens and prejudge the war. Resolved on fight, I am no longer free to shun my death, if heaven my death decree. Then turning to the herald, thus pursues, Go greet the Trojan with ungrateful news. Denounce from me that when tomorrow's light shall gild the heavens, he need not urge the fight. The Trojan and Rutulian troops no more shall die with mutual blood the Latian shore. Our single swords the quarrel shall decide, and to the victor be the beauteous bride. He said, and striding on with speedy pace, he sought his coursers of the Thracian race. At his approach they tossed their heads on high, and proudly neighing promised victory. The sires of these Arithia sent from far, to grace Pilimenus when he went to war. The drifts of Thracian snows were scarce so white, nor northern winds in fleetness matched their flight. Officious grooms stand ready by his side, and some with combs their flowing manes divide, and others stroke their chests and gently soothe their pride. He sheathed his limbs and arms, a tempered mass of golden metal those, and mountain brass. Then to his head his glittering helm he tied, and girt his faithful falchion to his side. In his Atanian forge the god of fire, that falchion labored to the hero's sire. Immortal keenness on the blade bestowed, and plunged it hissing in the Stygian flood. Propped on a pillar, which the ceiling bore, was placed the lance a runcan actor wore, which with such force he brandished in his hand. The tough ash trembled like an osier wand, then cried, O ponderous spoil of actor slain, and never yet by Turnus tossed in vain. Fail not this day, thy wanted force, but go, sent by this hand to fierce the Trojan foe. Give me to tear his corslet from his breast, and from that eunuch head to rend the crest, dragged in the dust his frizzled hair to soil, hot from the vexing iron and smeared with fragrant oil. Thus, while he raves, from his wide nostrils flies a fiery steam, and sparkles from his eyes, so fair is the bull his loved female's sight. Proudly he bellows and preludes the fight. He tries his goring horns against the tree, and meditates his absent enemy. He pushes at the winds, he digs the strand with his black hoofs, and spurns the yellow sand. Nor less the Trojan in his Lemnian arms, to future fight his manly courage warms. He wets his fury, and with joy prepares to terminate at once the lingering war. To cheer his chiefs, and tender son relates what heaven had promised, and expounds the fates. Then to the Latian king he sends, to cease the rage of arms, and ratify the peace. The morn ensuing, from the mountain's height, had scarcely spread the skies with rosy light. The ethereal cursors, bounding from the sea, from out their flaming nostrils breathed the day, when now the Trojan and Rutulian guard in friendly labor joined, the list prepared. Beneath the walls they measure out the space, then sacred altars rear on sods of grass, where, with religious, their common gods they place, in purest white the priests their heads attire, and living waters bear, and holy fire, and o'er their linen hoods and shaded hair 
long twisted wreaths of sacred varian where in order issuing from the town appears the latin legion armed with pointed spears and from the fields advancing on a line the trojan and the tuscan forces join their various arms afford a pleasing sight a peaceful train they seem in peace prepared for fight betwixt the ranks the proud commanders ride glittering with gold and vests in purple dyed here Menestheus, author of the memian line and there mesapus born of seed divine the sign is given and round the listed space each man in order fills his proper place reclining on their ample shields they stand and fix their pointed lances in the sand now studious of the sight a numerous throng of either sex promiscuous old and young swarm the town by those who rest behind, the gates and walls and houses topped are lined. Meantime the queen of heaven beheld the sight, with eyes unpleased from Mount Albano's height, since called Albano by succeeding fame, but then an empty hill without a name. She thence surveyed the field, the Trojan powers, the Latian squadrons, and Laurentine towers. Then thus the goddess of the skies bespoke, with sighs and tears, the goddess of the lake. King Turnus' sister, once a lovely maid, Heir to the lust of lawless Jove betrayed, Compressed by force, but by the grateful god, Now made the nighest of the neighboring flood. O nymph, the pride of living lakes, said she, O most renowned and most beloved by me, Long hast thou known, nor need I to record, The wanton sallies of my wandering lord, Of every Latian fair whom Jove misled, To mount by stealth my violated bed. To thee alone I grudged not his embrace, But gave a part of heaven and an unenvied place. Now learn from me thy near-approaching grief, Nor think my wishes want to thy relief, While fortune favor nor heaven's king denied To lend my succor to the Latian side. I saved thy brother and the sinking state, But now he struggles with unequal fate, And goes, with gods averse, o'ermatched in might, to meet inevitable death and in fight. Nor must I break the truce, nor can sustain the sight. Thou, if thou darest thy present aid supply, it well becomes a sister's care to try. At this the lovely nymph, with grief oppressed, thrice tore her hair and beat her comely breast, to whom Saturnia thus, Thy tears are late, haste, snatch him, if he can be snatched from fate. New tumults kindle, violate the truce. Who knows what changeful fortune may produce? It's not a crime to attempt what I decree, or if it were, discharge the crime on me, she said, and sailing on the winged wind, left the sad nymph suspended in her mind. And now, pomp the peaceful kings appear, four steeds the chariot of the Latinus bears, twelve golden beams around his temple play, to mark his lineage from the god of day. Two snowy coursers turn his chariot yoke, and in his hand two massy spears he shook. Then issued from the camp, in arms divine, Aeneas, author of the Roman line, and by his side Ascanius took his place, the second hope of Rome's immortal race. Adorned in white, a reverend priest appears, and offerings to the flaming altars bears a porket, and a lamb that never suffered shears. Then to the rising sun he turns his eyes, and strews the beasts designed for sacrifice. With salt and meal, with like officious care, he marks their foreheads, and he clips their hair. Betwixt their horns the purple wine he sheds. With the same generous juice the flame he feeds. Aeneas then unsheathed his shining sword, and thus with pious prayers the gods adored. All-seeing sun and thou, Ausonian soil, for which I have sustained so long a toil, thou king of heaven and thou the queen of air, propitious now and reconciled by prayer, thou god of war, whose unresisted sway the labors and events of arms obey, ye living fountains and ye running floods, all powers of ocean, all ethereal gods, hear and bear record if i fall in field or recreant in the fight to turnus yield my trojans shall increase evander's town 
Ascanius shall renounce the Estonian crown. All claims, all questions of debate shall cease, nor he nor they with force infringe the peace. But if my juster arms prevail and fight, as sure they shall, for if I divine a right, my Trojans shall not o'er the Italians reign, both equal, both unconquered shall remain, joined in their laws, their lands, and their abodes. I ask but altars for my weary gods. The care of those religious rites be mine, the crown to King Latinus I resign, his be the sovereign sway, nor will I share his power in peace or his command in war. For me, my friends, another town shall frame, and bless the rising towers with fair Lavinia's name. Thus he, then, with erected eyes and hands, the Latian king before his altar stands. By the same heaven, said he, and earth, and main, and all the powers that all three contain, by hell below, and by that upper god whose thunder signs the peace, who seals it with his nod. So let Latona's double offspring hear, and double-fronted Janus what I swear. I touch the sacred altars, touch the flames, and all those powers attest, and all their names. Whatever chance befall on either side, no term of time this union shall divide. No force, no fortune shall my vows unbind, or shake the steadfast tenor of my mind. Not though the circling seas should break their bound, o'erflow the shores, or sap the solid ground. Not though the lamps of heaven their spheres forsake, hurled down and hissing in the nether lake, even as this royal scepter, for he bore a scepter of his hand, shall never more shoot out in branches or renew the birth, an orphan now, cut from the mother earth, by the keen axe dishonored of its hair and cased in brass for Latian kings to bear. When thus in public view the peace was tied, with solemn vows and sworn on either side, all dues performed, which holy rites require. The victim beasts are slain before the fire, the trembling entrails from their bodies torn, and to the fattened flames in chargers borne. Already the Rutulians deem their man o'ermatched in arms, before the fight began. First rising fears are whispered through the crowd, then gathering sound they murmur more aloud. Now side to side they measure with their eyes the champion's bulk, their sinews and their size. The nearer their approach, the more is known, the apparent disadvantage of their own. Turnus himself appears in public sight, conscious of his fate, desponding of the fight. Slowly he moves, and at his altar stands, with eyes dejected and with trembling hands. And while he mutters undistinguished prayers, a livid deadness in his cheeks appears. With anxious pleasure... When Juturna viewed the increasing fright of the mad multitude, when their short sighs and thickening sobs she heard, and found their ready minds for change prepared, dissembling her immortal form she took, Camertus mien, his habit and his look. A chief of ancient blood, in arms well known, was his great sire, and he his greater son. His shape assumed, amid the ranks she ran, and humoring their first motions, thus began. For shame, Rutulians, can you bear the sight of one exposed for all in single fight? Can we, before the face of heaven, confess our courage colder, our numbers less? View all the Trojan host, the Arcadian band, and Tuscan army, count them as they stand. Undaunted to the battle if we go, scarce every second man will share a foe. Turnus, tis true, in this unequal strife, shall lose with honor his devoted life, or change it, rather, for immortal fame, succeeding to the gods from whence he came. But you, a servile and inglorious band, for foreign lords shall sow your native land. Those fruitful fields your fighting fathers gained, which have so long their lazy sons sustained. With words like these she carried her design. A rising murmur runs across the line. Then even the city troops and Latians, tired with tedious war, seem with new souls inspired. Their champions' fate, with pity they lament, and of the league so lately sworn re repent. Nor fails the goddess to foment the rage, with lying wonders and a false presage, but adds a sign 
which present to their eyes inspires new courage and a glad surprise. For sudden, in the fiery tracts above, appears in pomp the imperial bird of Jove. A plump of fowl he spies that swims the lakes, and o'er their head his sounding pinions shakes. Then stooping on the fairest of the train, in his strong talons trusts a silver swan. The Italians wonder at the unusual sight, but while he lags and labors in his flight, behold, the dastard fowl return anew, and with united force the foe pursue. Clamorous around the royal hawk they fly, and thickening in a cloud o'ershade the sky. They cuff, they scratch, they cross his airy course, nor can the encumbered burn sustain their force, but vexed, not vanquished, drops the ponderous prey, and lightened of his burthen, wings his way. The Ausonian bands with shouts salute the sight, eager of action and demand the fight. Then King Toluminus, versed in augur's arts, cries out, and thus his boasted skill imparts. At length tis granted what I long desired, this, this is what my frequent vows required. Ye gods, I take your omen and obey. Advance, my friends, and charge, I lead the way. These are the foreign foes whose impious band, like that rapacious bird, infest our land. But soon, like him, they shall be forced to the sea, by strength united and forego the prey. Your timely succor to your country bring. Haste to the rescue and redeem your king. He said, and, pressing onward through the crew, poised his lifted arm, and his lance he threw. The winged weapon, whistling in the wind, came driving on, nor missed the marked design. At once the cornel rattled in the skies, at once tumultuous shouts and clamors rise. Nine brothers in a goodly band there stood, born of Arcadian mixed with Tuscan blood. Gylippus' sons, the fatal javelin threw, Aimed at the midmost of the friendly crew, A passage through the jointed arms it found, Just where the belt was to the body bound, And struck the gentle youth extended on the ground. Then fired with pious rage, The generous train run madly forward To revenge the slain, And some with eager haste their javelins throw, And some with sword in hand assault the foe. The wished insult the Latin troops embrace, and meet their ardor in the middle space. The Trojans, Tuscans, and Arcadian line with equal courage obviate their design. Peace leaves the violated fields, and hate both armies urges to their mutual fate. With impious haste their altars are o'erturned, the sacrifice half broiled and half unburned. Thick storms of steel from either army fly, and clouds of clashing darts obscure the sky. Brands from the fire are missive weapons made, With chargers, bulls, and all the priestly trade. Latinus, frightened, hastens from the fray, And bears his unregarded gods away. These on horses vault, those yoke the car, The rest with swords on high run headlong to the war. Messapus, eager to confound the peace, Spurred his hot courser through the fighting priests. At King Alestes, by his purple known at Tuscan prince, and by his regal crown, and, with a shock encountering, bore him down. Backwards he fell, and as his fate designed, the ruins of an altar were behind. There, pitching on his shoulders and his head, amid the scattering fires, he lay supinely spread. The beamy spear descending from above, his cuirass pierced, and through his body drove. Then with a scornful smile the victor cries, the gods have found a fitter sacrifice, greedy of the spoils. The Italians strip the dead of his rich armor and uncrown his head. Priest Corianus armed his better hand from his own altar with a blazing brand, and as Abusus with a thundering pace advanced to battle, dashed it on his face. His bristly beard shines out with sudden fires. The crackling crop a noisome scent expires. Following the blow, he seized his curling crown with his left hand. His other cast him down. The prostrate body with his knees he pressed, and plunged his holy poniard in his breast. 
while Podilirus, with his sword, pursued the shepherd Alsus through the flying crowd. Swiftly he turns and aims a deadly blow full on the front of his unwary foe. The broad axe enters with a crashing sound and cleaves the chin with one continued wound. Warm blood and mingled brains besmear his arms around. An iron sleep his stupid eyes oppressed and sealed their heavy lids in endless rest. But good Aeneas rushed amidst the bands. There was his head, and naked were his hands, in sign of truce. Then thus he cried aloud, What sudden rage, what new desire of blood inflames your altered minds? O Trojans, cease from impious arms, nor violate the peace. By human sanctions and by laws divine, the terms are all agreed, the war is mine. Dismiss your fears, and let the fight ensue. This hand alone shall right the gods and you. Our injured altars and their broken vow, to this avenging sword, the faithless Turnus owe. Thus while he spoke, unmindful of defense, a winged arrow struck the pious prince. But whether from some human hand it came, or hostile god, is left unknown by fame. No human hand or hostile god was found, to boast the triumph of so base a wound. When Turnus saw the Trojan quit the plain, his chiefs, dismayed, his troops a fainting train, the unhoped event his heightened soul inspires. At once his arms and coursers he requires. Then, with a leap, his lofty chariot gains, and with a ready hand assumes the reins. He drives impetuous, and wherever he goes, he leaves behind a lane of slaughtered foes. These his lance reaches. Over those he rolls his rapid car and crushes out their souls. In vain the vanquished fly, the victor sends the dead men's weapons at their living friends. Thus on the banks of Hebrus' freezing flood, the god of battles, in his angry mood, clashing his sword against his brazen shield, let loose the reins and scours along the field. Before the wind his fiery coursers fly, groans the sad earth, resounds the rattling sky, wrath terror, treason, tumult, and despair. Dire faces and deformed surround the car, friends of the god and followers of the war. With fury not unlike, nor less disdain, exulting Turnus flies along the plain. His smoking horses at their utmost speed he lashes on and urges over the dead. Their fetlocks run with blood, and when they bound, the gore and gathering dust are dashed around. Thamyris and Pholus, masters of the war, he killed at hand, but Stethonus afar. From far the sons of Imbracus he slew, Glaucus and ladies of the Lycian crew, both taught to fight on foot, in battle joined, or mount the courser that outstrips the wind. Meantime, Eumedes, vaunting in the field, New fired the Trojans, and their foes repelled. The son of Dolan bore his grandsire's name, but emulated more his father's name. His guileful father sent a knightly spy, the Grecian camp, in order to descry hard enterprise, and well he might require Achilles' car and horses for his hire. But met upon the scout, the Aetolian prince, in death bestowed a juster recompense. Fierce Turnus viewed the Trojan from afar, and launched his javelin from his lofty car. Then, lightly leaping down, pursued the blow, and pressing with his foot his prostrate foe, wrenched from his feeble hold the shining sword, and plunged it in the bosom of its lord. Possess, said he, the fruit of all thy pains, and measure at thy length our Latian plains. Thus are my foes rewarded by my hand, thus may they build their town, and thus enjoy the land. Then Darius Butis Sybaris he slew, whom o'er his neck his floundering courser threw. As when loud Boreas with his blustering train stoops from above, incumbent on the main, wherever he flies, he drives the rack before, and rolls the billows on the Aegean shore. So where resistless Turnus takes his course, the scattered squadrons bend before his force. His crests of horse's hair is blown behind by adverse air and rustles in the wind. This haughty Phegeus saw with high disdain, and as the chariot rolled along the plain, light from the ground he leapt and seized the rein. 
Thus hung in air, he still retained his hold. The coursers frighted and their course controlled. The lance of Turnus reached him as he hung and pierced his plated arms, but passed along and only raised the skin. He turned and held against his threatening foe his ample shield, then called for aid. But while he cried in vain, the chariot bore him backward on the plain. He lies reversed, the victor king descends, and strikes so justly where his helmet ends, he lops his head. The Latian fields are drunk with streams that issue from the bleeding trunk. While he triumphs, and while the Trojans yield, the wounded prince is forced to leave the field. Strong Menetsus and Achates often tried, and young Ascanius, weeping by his side, conduct him to his tent. Scarce can he rear his limbs from the earth, supported on his spear. Resolved in mind, regardless of the smart, he tugs with both his hands and breaks the dart. The steel remains. No readier way he found to draw the weapon than to enlarge the wound. Eager of fight, impatient of delay, he begs, and his unwilling friends obey. Iapis was at hand to prove his art, his blooming youth so fired Apollo's heart that for his love he proffered to bestow his tuneful harp and his unerring bow. The pious youth, more studious how to save his aged sire, now sinking to the grave, preferred the powers of plants and silent praise of healing art before Phoebean bays. Propped on his lance, the pensive hero stood, and heard and saw unmoved the mourning crowd. The famed physician tucked his robes around with ready hands and hastens to the wound. With gentle touches he performs his part, this way and that, soliciting the dart, and exercises all his heavenly art, all softening simples, known of sovereign use, he presses out and pours their noble juice, their first infused to lenify the pain, he tugs with pincers, but he tugs in vain. Then to the patron of his art he prayed, the patron of his art refused his aid. Meantime the war approaches to the tents, the alarm grows hotter and the noise augments. The driving dust proclaims the danger near, and first their friends and then their foes appear. Their friends retreat, their foes pursue the rear, the camp is filled with terror and affright, the hissing shafts within the trench alight, an undistinguished noise ascends the sky. The shouts those who kill, and the groans of those who die. But now the goddess mother, moved with grief, and pierced with pity, hastens her relief. A branch of healing dittany she brought, which in the Cretan fields with care she sought. Rough is the stern which woolly leaves surround, the leaves with flowers, the flowers with purple crowned. Well known to wounded goats, a sure relief, to draw the pointed steel and ease the grief. This Venus brings, in clouds involved, and brews the extracted liquor with ambrosian dews, and odorous panacea. Unseen she stands, tempering the mixture with her heavenly hands, and pours it in a bowl, already crowned with juice of medicinal herbs prepared to bathe the wound. The leech, unknowing of superior art, which aids the cure, with this foments the part and in a moment ceased the raging smart. Stanched is the blood, and in the bottom stands the steel, but scarcely touched with tender hands, moves up and follows of its own accord, and health and vigor are, are at once restored. Iapis first perceived the closing wound, and first the footsteps of a god he found. Arms, arms, he cries, the sword and shield prepare, and send the willing chief renewed to war. This is no mortal work, no cure of mine, nor art's effect, but done by hands divine. Some god our general to the battle sends, some god preserved his life for greater ends. The hero arms in haste, his hands enfold his thighs with quiches of refugent gold. Inflamed to the fight, and rushing to the field, that hand sustaining the celestial shield, this grips the lance, and with such vigor shakes, that to the rest the beamy weapon quakes. Then with a close embrace he strained his son, and kissing through his helmet thus began, My son, from my example learn the war, in camps to suffer and in fields to dare. 
But happier chance than mine attends thy care. This day my hand, thy tender aid, shall shield, And crowns with honor the, of the conquered field. Thou, when thy riper years send thee forth To toils of war, be mindful of my worth, Assert thy birthright, and in arms be known For Hector's nephew and Aeneas's son, he said, And striding issued on the plain. Antaeus and Menestheus and a numerous train Attend his steps, the rest their weapons take, And crowding to the field their camps forsake. A cloud of blinding dust is raised around, Labors beneath their feet the trembling ground. Now Turnus, posted on a hill from far, Beheld the progress of the moving war. With him the Latins viewed the covered plains, And the chill blood ran backwards in their veins. Juturna saw the advancing troops appear, And heard the hostile sound, and fled for fear. Aeneas leads and draws a sweeping train, Closed in their ranks and pouring on the plain, As when a whirlwind rushing to the shore From the mid-ocean drives the waves before. The painful hind with heavy heart foresees The flatted fields and slaughter of the trees. With like impetuous rage the prince appears, Before his doubled front, nor less destruction bears. And now both armies shock in open field, Osiris is by strong Thimbraeus killed. Archidas, Euphens, Epulon are slain, All famed in arms and of the Latian train, By Gaius, Menestheus, and Achates' hand. The fatal augur falls, by whose command The truce was broken, and whose lance imbrued With Trojan blood, the unhappy fight renewed. Loud shouts and clamors rend the liquid sky, And o'er the field... Frighted Latins fly, the prince disdains the dastards to pursue, nor moves to meet in arms the fighting few. Turnus alone, amid the dusky plain, he seeks, and to the combat calls in vain. Juturna heard and seized with mortal fear, forced from the beam her brother's charioteer, assumes his shape, his armor, and his mien, and like Mystiscus in his seat is seen. End of Book Twelve, Part One. Recording by David Lipa, San Francisco, California. Book 12, Part 2 of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lipa. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by John Dryden. Book 12, The Fortunes of War. Part two. As the black swallows near the palace plies, O'er empty courts and under arches flies, Now hawks aloft, now skims along the flood, To furnish her loquacious nest with food, So drives the rapid goddess over the plains. The smoking horses run with loosened reins, She steers a various course among the foes, Now here, now there, her conquering brother shows, now with a straight, now with a wheeling flight, She turns and bends, but shuns the single fight. Aeneas, fired with fury, breaks the crowd, And seeks his foe and calls by name aloud. He runs within a narrower ring, And tries to stop the chariot, but the chariot flies. If he but gain a glimpse, Juturna fears, And far away the Danian hero bears. What should he do? Nor arts nor arms avail, And various cares in vain his mind assail. The great Messapus thundering through the field, In his left hand two pointed javelins held, Encountering on the prince one dart he drew, And with unerring aim and utmost vigor threw. Aeneas saw it come, and stooping low, Beneath his buckler shunned the threatening blow. The weapon hissed above his head, And tore the wavering plume which on his helm he wore. Forced by this hostile act and fired with spite, That flying Turnus still declined the fight. The prince, whose piety had long repelled, His inborn ardor now invades the field, Invokes the powers of violated peace, Their rights and injured altars to redress, Then to his rage abandoning the rain, With blood and slaughtered bodies fills the plain. 
What God can tell, what numbers can display the various labors of that fatal day? What chiefs and champions fell on either side in combat slain, or by what deaths they died, whom Turnus, whom the Trojan hero killed, who shared the fame and fortune of the field? Jove, couldst thou view, and not avert thy sight, two jarring nations joined in cruel fight? Whom leagues of lasting love so shortly shall unite. Aeneas first Rutulian Sucro found, Whose valor made the Trojans quit the ground. Betwixt his ribs the javelin drove, So just it reached his heart, Nor needs a second thrust. Now Turnus at two blows two brethren slew. First from his horse fierce Amicus he threw, Then leaping on the ground on foot assailed Diorus, and an equal fight prevailed. Their lifeless trunks he leaves upon the place, their heads distilling gore his chariot grace. Three cold on earth the Trojan hero threw, whom without respite at one charge he threw. Cathegus, Tanias, Tagus fell oppressed, and sad Onithes added to the rest of Theban blood, whom Peridia bore. Turnus, two brothers from the Lycian's shore, and from Apollo's fane to battle sent, overthrew, nor Phoebus could their fate prevent. Peaceful Menothes, after these he killed, who long had shunned the dangers of the field. On Lerna's lake a silent life he led, and with his nets and angle earned his bread, nor pompous cares nor palaces he knew, but wisely from the infectious world withdrew. Poor was his house, his father's painful hand discharged his rent and plowed another's land. As flames along the lofty woods are thrown, on different sides and both by winds are blown, the laurels crackle in the sputtering fire, the frightened sylvans from their shades retire, or as two neighboring torrents fall from the sky, rapid they run, the foamy waters fry, they roll to the sea with unresisted force, and down the rocks precipitate their course. Not with less rage the rival heroes take their different ways, nor less destruction make. With spears afar, with swords at hand they strike, and zeal of slaughter fires their souls alike. Like them, their dauntless men maintain the field, and hearts are pierced unknowing how to yield. They blow for blow return, and wound for wound, and heaps of bodies raise the level ground. Moranus, boasting of his blood that springs from a long royal race of Latian kings, is by the Trojan from his chariot throne, crushed with the weight of an unwieldy stone. Betwixt the wheels he fell, the wheels that bore his living load his dying body tore. His starting steeds to shun the glittering sword, paw down his trampled limbs, forgetful of their lord. Fierce Hylas threatened high and face to face, affronted Turnus in the middle space. The prince encountered him in full career, and at his temples aimed the deadly spear. So fatally the flying weapon sped, that through his helmet pierced his head. Nor Sisius could escape from Turnus' hand, in vain the strongest of the Arcadian band. Nor to Capentus could his gods afford availing against the Aeneian sword which to his naked heart pursued the course, nor could his plated shield sustain the force. Aeolus fell, whom not the Grecian powers, nor great subverter of the Trojan towers were doomed to kill, while heaven prolonged his date. But who can pass the bounds prefixed by fate? In high Lernesis and in Troy he held two palaces, and was from each expelled, of all the mighty man that last remains, a little spot of foreign earth contains. And now both hosts their broken troops unite in equal ranks and mix in mortal fight. Ceristhus and undaunted Menethus join the Trojan, Tuscan, and Arcadian line. Seaborn Messapus with Atanius heads, the Latin squadrons and to battle leads. They strike, they push, they throng the scanty space, Resolved on death, impatient of disgrace, And where one falls, another fills his place. The Cyprian goddess now inspires her son To leave the unfinished fight, and storm the town, 
For while he rolls his eyes around the plain in quest of Turnus, whom he seeks in vain, he views the unguarded city from afar, in careless quiet and secure of war. Occasion offers and excites his mind to dare beyond the task he first designed. Resolved, he calls his chiefs, they leave the fight. Attended thus, he takes a neighboring height, the crowding troops about their general stand, all under arms, and wait his high command. Then thus the lofty prince, Hear and obey, ye Trojan bands, without the least delay, Jove is with us, and what I have decreed requires our utmost vigor and our speed. Your instant arms against the town prepare, the source of mischief and the seat of war. This day the Latian towers that mate the sky shall level with the plain in ashes lie. The people shall be slaves, unless in their time they kneel for pardon and repent their crime. Twice have our foes been vanquished on the plain. Then shall I wait till Turnus will be slain? Your force against the perjured city bend. There it began, and there the war shall end. The peace profaned our rightful arms requires. Cleanse the polluted place with purging fires. He finished, and one soul inspiring all formed in a wedge. The foot approached the wall. Without the town, an unprovided train of gaping, gazing citizens are slain. Some firebrands, other scaling ladders bear, and those they toss aloft, and these they rear. The flames now launched, the feathered arrows fly, and clouds of missive arms obscure the sky. Advancing to the front, the hero stands, and stretching out to heaven his pious hands, attests the gods, asserts his innocence, upbraids with breach of faith the Ausonian prince, declares the royal honor doubly stained, and twice the rites of holy peace profaned. Dissenting clamors in the town arise, each will be heard, and all at once advise. One part for peace, one for war contends. Some would exclude their foes, and some admit their friends. The helpless king is hurried in the throng, and whatever the tide prevails is borne along. Thus when the swain within a hollow rock invades the bees with suffocating smoke, they run around or labor on their wings, disused to flight, and shoot their sleepy stings to shun the bitter fumes in vain they try black vapors issuing from the vent involve the sky but fate and envious fortune now prepare to plunge the latins in the last despair the queen who saw the foes invade the town and brands on top of burning houses thrown cast round her eyes distracted with her fear no troops of turnus in the field appear once more she stares abroad, but still in vain, and then concludes the royal youth is slain. Mad with her anguish, impotent to bear the mighty grief, she loathes the vital air. She calls herself the cause of all this ill, and owns the dire effects of her ungoverned will. She raves against the gods, she beats her breast. She tears with both her hands her purple vest. Then round a beam a running noose she tied, And fastened by the neck obscenely died. Soon as the fatal news by fame was blown, And to her dames and to her daughter known, The sad Lavinia rends her yellow hair And rosy cheeks, the rest her sorrows share. With shrieks the palace rings and madness of despair, The spreading rumor fills the public place, Confusion, fear, distraction, and disgrace, and silent shame are seen in every face. Latinus tears his garments as he goes, both for his public and his private woes. With filth his venerable beard besmears, and sordid dust deforms his silver hairs, and much he blames the softness of his mind, obnoxious to the charms of womankind and soon seduced to change what he so well designed, to break the solemn league so long desired, nor finish what his fates and those of Troy required. Now Turnus rolls aloof o'er empty plains, and here and there some struggling foes he gleans. His flying coursers please him less and less, ashamed of easy fight and cheap success. Thus half-contented, anxious in his mind, the distant cries come driving in the wind, 
Shouts from the walls, but shouts and murmurs drowned, a jarring mixture and a boding sound. Alas, said he, what mean these dismal cries? What doleful clamors from the town arise? Confused, he stops, and backward pulls the reins. She who the driver's office now sustains replies, Neglect, my lord, these new alarms. Here fight and urge the fortune of your arms. There want not others to defend the wall. If by your rival's hand the Italians fall, so shall your fatal sword his friends oppress, and honor equal, equal in success. To this the prince, O oh, sister, for I knew the peace infringed proceeded first from you. I knew you when you mingled first in fight, and now in vain you would deceive my sight. Why, goddess, this unprofitable care? Who sent you down from heaven, involved in air, your share of mortal sorrows to sustain, and see your brother bleeding on the plain? For to what power can Turnus have recourse, or how resist his fate's prevailing force? These eyes beheld Moranus bite the ground. Mighty the man, and mighty was the wound. I heard my dearest friend with dying breath, my name invoking to revenge his death. Brave Euphans fell, with honor on the place, to shun the shameful sight of my disgrace. On earth's supine, a manly corpse, he lies, his vest and armor are the victor's prize. Then shall I see Laurentum in a flame, which only wanted to complete my shame. How will the Latins hoot their champions' flight? How Drances will insult and point them to the sight? Is death so hard to bear, ye gods below? Since those above so small compassion show, Receive a soul unsullied yet with shame, Which not belies my great forefather's name, he said. And while he spoke with flying speed Came sages urging on his foamy steed, Fixed on his wounded face a shaft he bore, and seeking Turnus sent his voice before. Turnus, on you, on you alone depends our last relief. Compassionate your friends. Like lightning, fierce Aeneas rolling on with arms and vests, with flames invades the town. The brands are tossed on high, the winds conspire to drive along the deluge of the fire. All eyes are fixed on you. Your foes rejoice, even the king staggers and suspends his choice. Doubts to deliver or defend the town, whom to reject or whom to call his son. The queen on whom your utmost hopes were placed, herself suborning death, has breathed her last. Tis true, Misappus, fearless of his fate, with fierce Atenus' aid, defends the gate. On every side, surrounded by the foe, the more they kill, the greater numbers grow. An iron harvest mounts and still remains to mow. You, far aloof from your forsaken bands, your rolling chariot drive over empty. Stupid, he sate, his eyes on death declined, and various cares revolving in his mind, rage boiling from the bottom of his heart, and sorrow mixed with shame his soul oppressed, and conscious worth lay laboring in his thought, and love by jealousy to madness wrought, by slow degrees his reason drove away the mists of passion and resumed her sway. Then rising on his car, he turned his look and saw the town involved in fire and smoke, a wooden tower with flames already blazed, which his own hands on beams and rafters raised, and bridges laid above to join the space and wheels below to roll from place to place. Sister, the fates have vanquished, let us go, the way which heaven and my hard fortune show. The fight is fixed, nor shall the branded name of a base coward blot your brother's fame. Death is my choice, but suffer me to try my force and vent my rage before I die, he said, and leaping down without delay through crowds of scattered foes he freed his way. Striding he passed, impetuous as the wind, and left the grieving goddess far behind. As when a fragment from a mountain torn by raging tempests, or by torrents born, or sapped by time, or loosed from the roots, prone through the void, the rocky ruin shoots, rolling from crag to crag, from steep to steep, 
Down sink at once the shepherds and their sheep. Involved alike they rush to nether ground. Stunned with the shock they fall, and stunned from earth rebound. So Turnus, hasting headlong into town, Shouldering and shoving, bore the squadrons down. Still pressing onwards to the wall he drew, Where shafts and spears and darts promiscuous flew, And sanguine streams the slippery ground embrew. First stretching out his arm in sign of peace, He cries aloud to make the combat cease. Rutulians hold, and Latin troops retire. The fight is mine, and me the gods require. Tis just that I should vindicate alone the broken truce, or for the breach atone. This day shall free from wars the Ausonian state, or finish my misfortunes in my fate. Both armies from their bloody work desist, and bearing backwards form a spacious list. The Trojan hero who received from fame the welcome sound and heard the champion's name, soon leaves the taken works and mounted walls. Greedy of war, where the greater glory calls, he springs to fight, exulting in his force. His jointed armor rattles in the course. Like Eryx, or like Athos, great he shows. Or Father Epinine, when, white with snows, his head divine obscure in clouds he hides and shakes the sounding forest on his sides. The nations overawed secrete the fight, immovable their bodies fix their sight. Even death stands still, nor from above they throw their darts nor drive their battering rams below. In silent order either army stands and drop their swords unknowing from their hands. The Ausonian king beholds with wondering sight Two mighty champions matched in single fight, born under climes remote and brought by fate with swords to try their titles to the state. Now in closed field, each other from afar they view, and rushing on begin the war. They launch their spears, then hand to hand they meet. The trembling soil resounds beneath their feet. Their bucklers clash, their blows descend from high, and flakes of fire from their hard helmets fly. Courage conspires with chance, and both engage with equal fortunes yet in mutual rage. As when two bulls for their fair female fight in Silas' shades or on Tabernus' height. With horns adverse they meet, the keeper flies, mute stands the herd, their heifers roll their eyes, and wait the event which victor they shall bear, and who shall be the lord to rule the lusty year. With rage of love the jealous rivals burn, and push for push, and wound for wound return. Their dewlap scored, their sides are laved in blood. Loud cries and roaring sounds rebellow through the wood. Such was the combat in the listed ground, so clashed their swords, and so their shields resound. Jove sets the beam. In either scale he lays the champion's fate, and each exactly weighs. On this side life and lucky chance ascends, loaded with death that other scale descends. Raised on the stretch, young Turnus aims a blow, full on the helm of his unguarded foe. Shrill shouts and clamors ring on either side, as hopes and fears their panting hearts divide. But all in pieces flies the traitor sword, and in the middle stroke deserts his lord. Now is but death or flight disarmed he flies, when in his hand an unknown hilt he spies. Fame says that Turnus, when his steeds he joined, hurrying to war, disordered in his mind, snatched the first weapon which his haste could find. Twas not the fated sword his father bore, but that his charioteer Mesticus wore. This, while the Trojans fled, the toughness held, but vain against the great Vulcanian shield. The mortal-tempered steel deceived his hand. The shivered fragments shone amid the sand. Surprised with fear, he fled along the field, and now forthright, and now in orbits wheeled. For here the Trojan troops the lists surround, and there the pass is closed with pools and marshy ground. Aeneas hastens, though with heavier pace, his wounds so newly knit, retards the chase, and oft his trembling knees their aid refuse, yet pressing foot by foot, 
his foe pursues. Thus, when a fearful stag is closed around, with crimson toils or in a river found, high on the bank the deep-mouthed hound appears, still opening, following still, wherever he steers, the persecuted creature to and fro turns here and there to scape his umbrian foe. Steep is the ascent, and if he gains the land, the purple death is pitched along the strand, his eager foe, determined to the chase, stretched at his length, gains ground at every pace. Now to his balmy head he makes his way, and now he holds, or thinks he holds, his prey. Just at the pitch the stag springs out with fear. He bites the wind and fills his sounding jaws with air. The rocks, the lakes, the meadows ring with cries. The mortal tumult mounts and thunders in the skies. Thus flies the Danian prince, and flying blames his tardy troops, calling by their names, demands his trusty sword. The Trojan threats the realm with ruin, and their ancient seats to lay in ashes, if they dare supply with arms or aid his vanquished enemy. Thus menacing, he still pursues the course with vigor, though diminished of his force. Ten times already the listed place one chief had fled, and the other given chase. No trivial prize is played, for on the life or death of Turnus now depends the strife. Within the space an olive tree had stood, a sacred shade, a venerable wood, for vows to Faunus pay the Latin's guardian god. Here hung the vests, and tablets were engraved of sinking mariners from shipwrecked save. With heedless hands the Trojans felled the tree, to make the ground enclosed for combat free. Deep in the root, whether by fate or chance or erring haste, the Trojan drove his lance, then stooped and tugged with force immense to free the encumbered spear from the tenacious tree, that whom his fainting limbs pursued in vain, his flying weapon might from far attain. Confused with fear, bereft of human aid, then Turnus to the gods and first to Faunus prayed, O Faunus, pity! And thou, Mother Earth, where I, thy foster son, received my birth, hold fast the steel. If my religious hand your plant has honored, which your foes profaned, propitious hear my prayers, he said, nor with successless vows invoke their aid. The incumbent hero wrenched and pulled and strained, but still the stubborn earth the steel detained. Juturna took her time, and while in vain he strove, assumed Meticus' form again and in that imitated shape restored the despairing prince his Danian sword. The queen of love, who with disdain and grief, saw the bold nymph afford this prompt relief to assert her offspring with a greater deed from the tough root of the lingering weapon freed. Once more erect, the rival chiefs advance. One trusts the sword, the other the pointed lance and both resolved alike to try their fatal chance. Meantime, Imperial Jove to Juno speak, who from a shining cloud been, beheld the shock. What new arrest, O Queen of Heaven, is sent to stop the fates now laboring in the event? What farther hopes are left thee to pursue? Divine Aeneas, and thou knows it too, foredoomed to these celestial seats are due. What more attempts for Turnus can be made, That this thou lingerest in this lonely shade? Is it becoming of the due respect and awful honor of a god-elect, A wound unworthy of our state to feel, Patient of human hands and earthly steel? Or seems it just the sister should restore a second sword, When one was lost before, And arm a conquered wretch against his conqueror? For what? Without thy knowledge and avow, nay more, thy dictate durst Juturna do. At last, in deference to my love, forbear to lodge within thy soul this anxious care. Reclined upon my breast, thy grief unload. Who should relieve the goddess but the god? Now all things to their utmost issue tend, pushed by the fates to their appointed while leave was given thee, and a lawful hour for vengeance, wrath, and unresisted power. Tossed on the seas, thou could thy foes distress, and driven ashore with hostile arms oppress, deform the royal house, 
and from the side of the just bridegroom tear the plighted bride. Now cease at my command, the thunderer said, and with dejected eyes this answer Juno made. Because your dread decree too well I knew, from Turnus and from earth unwilling I withdrew, else should you not behold me here alone, involved in empty clouds, my friends bemoan, but girt with vengeful flames in open sight, engaged against my foes in mortal fight. Tis true, Juturna mingled in the strife, by my command, to save her brother's life, at least to try, but by the Stygian lake, the most religious oath the gods can take, with this restriction not to bend the bow, or toss the spear, or trembling dart to throw, and now resigned to your superior might, and tired with fruitless toils, I loathe the fight. This let me beg, and this no fates withstand, both for myself and for your father's land, that when the nuptial bed shall bind the peace, which I, since you ordain, consent to bless, the laws of either nation be the same, but let the Latins still retain their name. Speak the same language which they spoke before, wear the same habits which their grandsires wore, Call them not Trojans, perish the renown and name of Troy, with that detested town. Latium be Latium still, let Alba reign, and Rome's immortal majesty remain. Then thus the founder of mankind replies, unruffled was his front, serene his eyes. Can Saturn's issue and heaven's other air such endless anger in her bosom bear? Be mistress! and your full desires obtain, but quench the collar you foment in vain. From ancient blood the Ausonian people sprung, shall keep their name, their habit, and their tongue. The Trojans to their customs shall be tied. I will myself their common rights provide. The natives shall command, the foreigners subside. All shall be Latium, Troy without a name. And her lost sons forget from whence they came. From blood so mixed a pious race shall flow, Equal to gods excelling all below. No nation more respect to you shall pay, Or greater offerings on your altars lay. Juno consents, well pleased that her desires had found success, And from the cloud retires. The peace thus made the thunderer next prepares To force the watery goddess from the wars. Deep in the dismal regions void of light, Three daughters are at a birth were born to night. These their brown mother, brooding on her care, endued with windy wings to flit in air, with serpents girt alike and crowned with hissing hair. In heaven the dire called, and still at hand, before the throne of angry Jove they stand, his ministers of wrath, and ready still, the minds of mortal men with fears to fill. Whenever the moody sire to wreak his hate on realms or towns deserving of their fate, hurls down diseases, death, and deadly care, and terrifies the guilty world with war. One sister plague, if these from heaven he sent, to fright Juturna with a dire portent, the pest comes whirling down, by far more slow springs the swift arrow from the Parthen bow, or side on you, when traversing the skies, and drenched in poisonous juice, the sure destruction flies, with such a sudden and unseen a flight, shot through the clouds the daughter of the night, soon as the field enclosed she had in view, and from afar her destined quarry knew, contracted to the boding bird she turns, which haunts the ruined piles and hallowed urns, and beats about the tombs with nightly wings, where songs obscene on sepulchres she sings. Thus lessened in her form with frightful cries, the fury round unhappy Turnus flies, flaps on his shield and flutters o'er his eyes. A lazy chillness crept along his blood, choked was his voice, his hair with horror stood. Juturna from afar beheld her fly, and knew the ill omen by her screaming cry and strider of her wings. Amazed with fear, her beauteous breast she beat and rent her flowing hair. Ah me, she cries, in this unequal strife, what can thy sister more to save thy life? Weak as I am, can I, alas, contend in arms 
with that inexorable fiend. Now, now, I quit the field. Forbear to fright my tender soul, ye baleful birds of night. The lashing of your wings I know too well, the sounding flight and funeral screams of hell. These are the gifts you bring from haughty Jove, the worthy recompense of my ravished love. Did he for this exempt my life from fate? O oh, hard conditions of immortal state! Though born to death, not privileged to die, But forced to bear imposed eternity, Take back your envious bribes and let me go, Companion to my brother's ghost below. The joys are vanished, nothing now remains Of life immortal, but immortal pains. What earth will open her devouring womb To rest a weary goddess in the tomb? She drew a length of sighs. Nor more, she said, but in her azure mantle wrapped her head, then plunged into her stream with a deep despair, and her last sobs came bubbling up in air. Now stern Aeneas his weighty spear against his foe, and thus abrades his fear. What farther subterfuge can Turnus find? What empty hopes are harbored in his mind? Tis not thy swiftness can secure thy flight, Nor with their feet but hands the valiant fight. Vary thy shape in thousand forms, And dare what skill and courage can attempt in war. Wish for the wings of winds to mount the sky, Or hid within the hollow earth to lie. The champion shook his head and made this short reply. No threats of thine, my manly mind, can move. Tis hostile heaven I dread and partial Jove. He said no more, but with a sigh repressed the mighty sorrow in his swelling breast. Then as he rolled his troubled eyes around, an antique stone he saw the common bound of neighboring fields and barrier of the ground, so vast that twelve strong men of modern days the enormous weight from earth could hardly raise. He heaved it at a lift and poised on high, ran staggering on his enemy, but so disordered that he scarcely knew his way or what unwieldy weight he threw. His knocking knees are bent beneath the load, and shivering cold congeals his vital blood. The stone drops from his arms, and falling short for want of vigor mocks his vain effort. And as when a heavy sleep has closed the sight, the sickly fancy labors in the night, we seem to run, and destitute of force, our sinking limbs forsake us in the course. In vain we heave for breath, in vain we cry, the nerves embrace, their usual strength deny, and on the tongue the faltering accents die. So Turnus fared, whatever means he tried, all force of arms and points of art employed, the fury flew athwart, and made the endeavor void. A thousand various thoughts his soul confound. He started about, nor aid nor issue found. His own men stop the pass, and his own walls surround. Once more he pauses and looks out again, and seeks the goddess charioteer in vain. Trembling he views the thundering chief advance, and brandishing aloft the deadly lance. Amazed he cowers beneath the conquering foe, forgets to ward and waits the coming blow. Astonished while he stands and fixed with fear, Aimed at his shield, he sees the impending spear. The hero measured first, with narrow view, The destined mark, and rising as he threw, With its full swing the fatal weapon flew. Not with less rage the rattling thunder falls, Or stones from battering engines break the walls. Swift as a whirlwind, from an arm so strong The lance drove on, and bore the death along. Not could his sevenfold shield the prince avail, nor aught beneath his arms the coat of mail. It pierced through all, and with a grisly wound transfixed his thigh, and doubled him to ground. With groans the Latins rend the vaulted sky, woods, hills, and valleys, to the voice reply. Now low on earth the lofty chief is laid, and with eyes cast upward, and with arms displayed, and recreant thus to the proud victor prayed. I know my death deserved, nor hope to live. Use what the gods and thy good fortune give. Yet think, O oh think, if mercy may be shown, 
Thou hadst a father once, and hast a son. Pity my sire, now sinking to the grave, And for Anchises' sake, old Donus, save. Or if thy vowed revenge pursue my death, Give to my friends my body void of breath. The Latian chiefs have seen me beg my life. Thine is the conquest, thine the royal wife, Against the yielded man. Tis mean, ignoble strife. In deep suspense the Trojan seemed to stand, And, just prepared to strike, repressed his hand. He rolled his eyes, and every moment felt His manly soul with more compassion melt. When casting down a casual glance he spied The golden belt that glittered on his side, The fatal spoils which haughty Turnus tore From dying palace and in triumph war. Then roused and new to wrath, he loudly cries, Flames, while he spoke, came flashing from his eyes. Traitor, dost thou, dost thou to grace pretend, Clad as thou art in trophies of my friend? To his sad soul a grateful offering go, Tis Pallas, Pallas gives this deadly blow. He raised his arm aloft, and at the word, Deep in his bosom drove the shining sword. The streaming blood disdained his arms around, and the disdainful soul came rushing through the wound. End of Book 12 End of the Aeneid by Virgil Translated by John Dryden Recording by David Lipa San Francisco, California